Hey, what up? Welcome back to the Orange Bloods Texas Football YouTube channel. I'm Ari Temkin along with Jeff Ketchum, our fearless leader. What's up, GK? How are you, buddy? What's up, man? I always enjoy doing video. We don't do enough of these. So True. it's good to be back on the channel with my man, Ari Temkin. You too, bud. Okay, so one of the interesting subplots to this game, Texas OU, is what is it like the last decade that the team that's led the in rushing has won the game. It's like been like the, the running the football has been the key to winning this game for the last decade. It seems like, right. And that, go, that goes back to Mac Brown. You know, this is, it's not like in the Tom Herman years, right. Or when Lincoln Riley started off. I mean, that is a truth about this game that goes deep into the Mac Brown, Bob Stoops years. And here we are in 2021 and it's, you know, this modern day Steve Sarkeesian versus Lincoln Riley matchup. And it's still kind of blood and guts who ran the ball better that ends up so, oftentimes weirdly determining this game. So why, so we need, we know all we need to know, right? Texas is going to win this game then, right? <laughs> well, you, look, it's funny because Anwar and I have been, I don't want to say bickering, kind of bickering, like the Muppet, the old guys from the Muppets this week. Uh, I keep bringing up that Oklahoma's, I keep bringing up that Oklahoma's run defense is the best in the big 12 and it's really good. I mean, they're averaging, I think 80 ish yards a game that they're yeah, allowing they're, in the run game. They're 2.9 per carry, which is like 10th or 11th nationally. Yeah. No, I mean, they're, they're really good. And, and Texas has the best run offense in the big 12 right now. 280 ish yards per game and it hasn't mattered whether or not it's Bijan or Keelan or Roshan I mean all those dudes are averaging I think one of the weird stats of this Texas team is if I, I'd have to look and see if it updated through this week but for most of the season Bijan's yards per carry ranked third on the team that's unbelievable that when Roshan and Keelan Robinson come in they they have the ability to you know post big numbers as well. And I think, you know, Bijan's like in the six point something category and those other dudes are like at seven and eight. So yeah, on paper, Texas should be able to run the ball really well, except it's hard not to think about the Arkansas game. Texas has played one, let's just even say semi legitimate defense so far this season and Arkansas did a real number on them offensively. But how much how much can we take away from that game because of the ineffectiveness of the quarterback position? I mean, granted, I think it's a good example because this is this Oklahoma defensive line is as good, you know, as Arkansas's defensive line. So it's the question about who wins up front. But at the same time, too, it's like we know how compromised the quarterback position was in that game. So when you're one dimensional, like forget it. It's a completely fair point. Uh, and it's important to point out that last week they were one dimensional right. against TCU. Yeah. yeah. And they ran the hell out of the ball. Now TCU allowed 350 yards rushing to SMU. So maybe they can just be had that way. I think that, I think you make a good point in that it's, it's a Casey Thompson led offense now, especially now that he's made a few starts is different than, than what Hudson Card and that Texas offense would have done uh, in that first half and going into the third quarter against Arkansas, except going back into August, the, the weird little bugaboo for this offense was its offensive line. Yep. And they had scrimmages where it was like they couldn't block the Texas defensive line, that the offense couldn't run consecutive plays without – the entire play being blown up because somebody couldn't block. And we thought, well, God, maybe that just means the Texas defensive line is awesome. They haven't been. Right. Arkansas blew up that Texas offensive line pretty much on a play-by-play -play basis. And, it, and so consequently, Bijan wasn't very effective against Arkansas either. I'm, I'm slightly concerned for Texas going into this game that the Oklahoma defensive line is a – more productive and better version than this Texas defensive line has been this year. What does it do to this offense and specifically the running game, which is what we're talking about. If there are jailbreaks, because it's good on good 
but one guy's goods just a lot. For instance, we talked about it a lot this week. Nick Bonita against Christian Jones for 60 minutes. It's a problem. It's it's a it's a big problem. And there's a couple of different things that you think about. One, they just got to give him help. I mean, he if they leave him one-on-one with Bonita, he's going to change the game in a negative way for Texas. So oh, they've got, they got to put a guy in line at tight end, I think, and help that dude all game long. They have 25 TFLs against Texas in the last two years in this game. That's wild. <laughs> I mean, and you think back the last two years, like, yeah, they've lived in their backfield. And so, I mean, on the one hand, it's like, well, Texas should win this game because whoever runs the ball more effectively will win it. And Texas is like not even close to a yeah. better running team. But then I look at the defensive line, Perry Winfrey, Isaiah Thomas, you know, Nick Benito. I mean, and that, and the offensive line for Texas, which has struggled. And it's like, uh, now I don't know because there's such I, an advantage for that. If I that. tell you that Benito has two sacks on Saturday, that feels light to me, potentially. Right. Like I was going to say, I'll take the over. Exactly. That's a, that's a, that's a hardcore thing to say, but if we put 2.0 as the sacks for Benito on Saturday, uh, I was caught sitting there calling him Benito because he's so pretty. Um, I think that, you know, how do you, if you're Texas, how do you survive just that one guy potentially making, you know, because that doesn't, we don't know what happens at the end of those plays are those fumbles are those drive killers or, you know what I mean? It's, you, you, you hear the stats sometime and it just, it's an empty thing. If it's two sacks, but one of them leads to a touchdown or right. a short field or something. And that's with none of the other, that's just one. It's Oklahoma's arguably their best player pound for pound on the team yep. going up against, I would say one of the 10 lowest performing starters combined on your 22 so i don't want to go so far as to say he's in the worst three players or anything like that but he's in their bottom half of starters if you take both of their lineups and combine them i mean he's the lowest performing offensive lineman and that's scary that's it'd be like if you had Ari, a terrible cornerback and it was like oh it's julio jones week You know what I mean? It's like, oh, but I don't need necessarily mean the Tennessee version of Julio. Right. It's Devontae Adams. Right. Right. Like it's just pick whoever you want to. It's Calvin Johnson and his pump week. Right. Like, and it's like, oh, and it's their very best guy against our single worst potential matchup nightmare. And I think that when I look at this game and I know Texas fans may be like looking for the revolver right now and like wanting to put it in their mouth after listening to me talk about this, but this is a, this is real. This is what Texas is going to have to find a way to thrive in is a situation where their offensive line matchups do not favor them. So how do they achieve success with that dynamic involved? And we just haven't seen it yet this season. Well, and, and if you're a Texas fan, that's also a Dallas Cowboys fan. There's a similar dynamic that's played out with Terrence Steele at right tackle, you know, because he came in last year as an undrafted free agent and was just a mess when left on an island. And this year he's been better, but it's because of the help they provided. And I mean, you're you're talking about, you know, Bosa and I mean, just the pass rush. It's, like, it's, it's a very similar thing. Right. And so... They've done a good job. They've they brought an extra lineman. They they brought in two tight ends to that side, you know, and, and they've used you know, Connor McGovern as a, a fullback essentially at times. So I think that's like that Sark, you said it at the start, he cannot leave Christian Jones on the outside, just on an Island trying to, you know, go one-on-one with Nick Benito because that's where Alex Grinch is going to find the weakness and continue to blitz on that side. Well, the funny like, thing is that like, that's where he naturally lines up. So that's not even a wrinkle. <laughs> that's literally them like you guys have been waiting all year for this one we don't have to do anything different we're just <laughs> going to line you up and look the other thing is 
we laugh and like point at Christian Jones, but it is also important to note that Texas had a change within its offensive line. Right. So now you've got Andre Carrick playing right tackle with Kerstetter moving in. And whatever Kerstetter isn't as a run blocker at times at tackle, he's been a really good pass protector. I mean, a couple of years ago, his pro football focus college passer block rating was like the best in the big 12. And so, I mean, he's capable. I thought he helped Christian Jones actually that taking Denzel Okafor out and sliding Kerstetter over, I thought stabilized the offensive line in a way that people kind of forgot about as the game went on. I was going to ask you if you thought that this was a better setup for the offensive line. I do, but I do worry now in this game that your left tackle is your most concerning offensive line position and your right tackle is your youngest and, and most inexperienced. Cause what, at least what you would say about Christian Jones is he's been through some battles now. So I mean, he's seen Benito. So it's not even like he's playing a guy that he doesn't, he's never seen before. You know, well, if you're Oklahoma, right. you probably do move Benito over to Carrick side at least a couple of times because you really want to you put some pressure on that kid. And so it is a bit alarming that both bookends are guys that, you know, if I'm, if I'm Grinch, I'm finding ways to ask questions yeah. of those players. And if they answer it, Hey, then those guys end up being really good, but I'm a million dollar a year defensive coordinator. And it's my job to create situations that might make my side of the ball win and for me, if I'm Grinch, I'm looking at those two players and I'm like, we can make some hay there this week. And if we don't, we'll walk away really disappointed. So let me ask you this on the running back situation. Um, so I'm sure you saw that um, Gary Patterson was asked about why Zach Evans' workload paled in comparison last week to Bajan Robinson's. Evans had like 15 for 113. Of course, we know about Evans, you know, his recruitment out of North Shore, um, and, you know, he basically committed to every SEC school before, you know, essentially s- setting up at TCU. So it's a good comparison because they're both highly recruited kids, feature backs. Um, his, his quote was, quote, I would never do 35 carries like they did for the guy at Texas. If you want to last, if you want to last four years, if you want to, la- I'd never do 35 carries like they did for the guy at Texas. If you want to last four years, Evans does need more touches though, end quote. What do you make of that? I thought it was a recruiting comment. I yeah. mean, because look, you know, it's true. These five-star running backs in high school, they don't want 35 carries. Whenever so that's you, what I was going to ask you. Would they want 35 or, thir- or 15? I think they've want 15-ish, 15 to 20-ish on paper because the best running backs in the country, they they realize I'm playing three years. I got to be careful not to get DeMarco murrayed with the Cowboys into the ground. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the most obvious example. If, if DeMarco starts getting 35 carries a game, and I don't think that's going to happen, but if he did, they'd probably be like, Hey, remember DeMarco Murray's last year with the Cowboys when they were just like to hell with it. YOLO. <laughs> he's, he's leaving next year. Eh, okay. We'll just run him to death. Oh, they I, they're that. not going to do happen. that with B. John. <laughs> It did. It did. (laughs) And DeMarco is such a good soldier that year, right? Like these players in the moment will also say, I'll do whatever it is that I'm asked. But, you know, look, the funny thing is. running backs coach now at Oklahoma and not still playing in the NFL. (laughs) Exactly. Isn't that funny? Uh, Bijan has never had a game. There's some things about Bijan that we don't know. He never was used as a workhorse last year, ever. And, you know, truly last couple of games of the season he's getting more of a workload than he was getting but it wasn't like Gary Patterson would have ever said that last year and then through the first four games of this season he's in the teens hadn't even hit 20 in a game and then they get into conference play they're on the road and I think if they'd have needed it they they'd have given him 40 so he needed all 35 yeah so I think that you know, I think it's all on the table. I don't expect that most weeks, but look, it is a fair thing to bring up in the sense of I did it when Charlie Strong was doing it with Deontay Foreman. I mean, it was like, 
man, kid carries the ball 40 something times. And you're just like, that's a lot for a guy. Right. Who's, you know, not getting paid. I don't know if NIL changes that now. Cause look, the, the, the game day guys did a, a segment last week about, well, is it okay to boo guys now that they're kind of getting paid? I mean, Bijan is the highest paid guy on the football team in these NIL deals. I don't know. At that point, you say, I'll oh, shut up. You are getting paid. You are a professional running back. So take your 35 carries real quick because I know we're going to wrap things up shortly. I would say – for all of the Texas fans that had revolvers in their mouths over the Christian Jones, <laughs> Andre Carrick comments, the thing, if we're going to use a Cowboys um, analogy, I'll always go back to Emmett Smith, where most, you take Eric Williams and Larry Allen out of the equation because they were drafted on those great Cowboy offensive lines. Rest of that offensive line was made up of parts, like, not the good part of the pig, not right. the pork ribs. It was like the ham hock, right? And it was like, oh, Nate Newton was the big old ham hock. And Mark Tuane was like a guy that had played on both sides of the ball. And Stepnowski was an undersized center that I think we all thought was going to be a great player, but he really hadn't. I guess I'm going, I'm going way too specific to say when you add a truly great running back into a backfield everybody else gets better yeah and the thing for all of the what happens when christian jones is left on an island with nick benito there might not be anything nick benito might do be able to do when Bijan throws one of those stop starts on him when he jump cuts it's his it's his superhero trick and you know there probably will be guys in the backfield but Bijan could still turn what otherwise would be a bad play into a 70 yard touchdown. Cause he's, he is the supernova in this game that really that's the only real difference between these two teams is it feels like Texas has an absolute superhero. Then it feels like Oklahoma has some guys that think they could be, but haven't quite done it. And, no, that's true. That's very and true. So like, you know, I expect to see Bijan do something special on Saturday. And I don't know that that means that the offensive line uh, blocked, like specifically, I think Bijan's going to have a big run. It doesn't mean I think that play is going to be really well blocked. I just don't think it matters all the times. And when you have a special player, it evens out your weaknesses to a certain degree. And yeah, I think that, up until now, that Texas running game's averaging as a whole seven plus yards per carry with their top three running backs combined. You know, it has to, that has to be a battle that every week they win. And as we started the video with, if you win that battle in this game, it has year in and year out translated to victory for the team that does it. And and the last point I'll make on this is I, I'm sure Sark watched the film from K, the K-State game last week. And Dewey Vaughn's a really good back. Um, he's a really, really good running back. And he didn't rush the ball very well against Oklahoma, but he f- impacted the game. He had yep. 10 catches for 100 and some odd yards. And so, I mean, that's how you can neutralize an effective blitz, obviously, is to use the, the screen game. And that, you know, Bajan, we haven't really seen him. I think he's getting between one and four catches a game. That's certainly a part of his game, though. That- he's averaging two. Is it two per game? He's got 10 catches in the year in five games. So, yeah. I mean, so even if they're having some trouble trying to run the ball. Give it to him five times. I mean. Seriously. If, if they get out of this game and Bijan hasn't caught no, five right. passes. Yeah. This is the week to do that. Hey, real quick. I, I don't want to take his. In the, it, it, on the Oklahoma side of the ball, I think the most alarming thing if you're the Texas defensive coaches watching the Kansas state game from a week ago, I thought Brooks and gray for the first time this season look like a, I don't want to say scary. Cause I, I don't want to overhype what they did last week, but I watched both of them and I was like, Oh, they look confident today. And OU's got a nice little back and forth going with both of those guys 
where they both had some success in the same game for really the only time this season. And it was like, if you're Texas, you're like, of course, they figured out a little something with their one-two punch in the backfield right, right before would they play us. But yeah, I think that on paper, it it should be the area that Texas wins, and yet it doesn't like sway me. I don't think in what direction I'm going to go with making a prediction at the end of the week. No, it's true. And and what I'll say on that is, I was at the game two years ago. The last time Kennedy Brooks played in this game because he he opted out last year. Yep. And he destroyed, like he was the key in that game against Texas. He was at, I don't know what his numbers were, but I just remember every, he just picked up so many first downs. And it was just, again, he was just a killer against Texas last year, two years ago. And that year he has not been the same back. Part of that's the offensive line. As much as we talk about Texas's offensive line, Oklahoma's offensive line is a shell of what it's been under, yeah. under Bill Biedenboe, who's one of the best in the, in, in, you know, in, in the country as an offensive line coach. Maybe the best. Yeah. So, I mean, this should – what, Texas has one TFL in the year? Is that what it is? On the defensive side of the ball? Yeah. Don't they have, like, one TFL or something r- ridiculous? It's, they got more than one. <laughs> But it's like not very many more. They don't. They here's the stat that I think will. will the, the Texas doesn't have a player. They've got one guy with three tackles for loss on the season, and I don't think anybody else has two. Wow. And they've got one guy with two sacks, and nobody else has more than one. That's a, that's it's almost half the season. That's. That's the growth point we need to see the most from in this game too, because Oklahoma's not great on their offensive front. So as much as we talk about how compromised Texas is on their front, Texas needs to take advantage of the defensive line uh, of uh, that Oklahoma offensive line. Texas fans, last thing I'll say, don't remember Kennedy Brooks's name. I think, I think he hasn't had the start this season that, uh, everybody would have expected from a guy that's a two-time 1,000 yard back. I mean, this is a guy that's been very successful as a collegiate player. I would have thought coming into this game that I would have been hyping up Eric Gray the most after the season Agreed. that he had at Tennessee. I'm mindful of how good though Kennedy Brooks is. And in his career, I believe his yards per carry over now this would be his third season is higher than Bijan's. So wow. I don't think he's better than Bijan. But this is a guy that has been incredibly productive. And I think a big part of what they'll want to do on Saturday in that game is get Kennedy Brooks going. And this has been a game where he's gotten going before. And Texas has just got to find a way that other teams have been able to limit Kennedy Brooks and Eric Gray this year. If you're Texas and you can't this week, It'll be a major disappointment because it'll really mean that you let them achieve success at a level that nobody else on the schedule has allowed. If you're Texas, you got to be out of the allowing the, you know, you can't be the asterisks on someone's schedule in all right. the bad ways. We couldn't run the ball all year. Then we played Texas and blew it uh, up. So if they, well, if they the just do what other teams have been doing on war, Texas will outrush Oklahoma. Yeah. And that's the key for that's Lincoln Riley's air raid is predicated on running the football. So like if they, if, if they're able to run the ball effectively on Texas, they're a problem. And that's like the reason their offense hasn't looked great this year is because they have not run the ball effectively. And that's again, Lincoln's offense and his, the, the air raid style that he runs, the success of it is predicated on running the football, which is very unique, but it is, it's, it's, it's a truth. And that's, they've been really good running the ball. That's why they've had eye popping, you know, record breaking statistical seasons offensively, but they haven't so far this year because they haven't run the ball effectively. Let me ask you a question. Yes. And last thing, but it's just running back related in the post game show Anwar said that he would take the Roshan Johnson, Keelan Robinson duo over Kennedy Brooks and Eric Gray and I was like, no way. I was like, if nothing else, those two guys have on paper had super successful seasons and have been all conference. And like, 
you got to pay that respect. Yeah, no way. I'm trying to look but, at what Kennedy Brooks, like his stats are. Um, but no way. I'm, um, he, he has been a shell of what he's been. Now, you know, he sat out last year and maybe that's a part of it. But it's just hard to believe that he'll be this bad all year. Um, yeah. I mean, and he's still averaging six yards a carry this year. <laughs> it's a down year. Three eighteen. It's a down year. He's only averaging six. There's something just in that offense that hasn't been right. And it's not the, it's not talent. It, they do. They do not right. lack talent. They lack some weird chemistry and juju of just, getting some momentum going, but anyway, yes, 7.3 per carry in his career. I'm telling you, it's one of the best in the history of college football and Oklahoma fans don't think of him as a, right. I, I had a conversation with uh, Josh McQuishan at Soonerscoop.com where I was kind of over, I was talking up Kennedy Brooks big time. And he was like, Oh, I wouldn't put him on the level of the best backs that I've seen Oklahoma have. And I was like, but yeah, his yards for carries historically good. 7.3 and 328 carries. That would rank number one in the history of the Texas football program. Higher than Earl, higher than Ricky, higher than Jamal Charles, higher than Cedric Benson. Damn. By more than a yard. Vince Young in his career was 6.5 yards per carry. Damn. So this guy might not end up being a first round draft pick. But historically, if He's you tough. hand him the he, if you just keep handing him the ball, your your offense will end up in the end zone mathematically. <laughs> yeah. You know, like <laughs> when you're in like plus seven yards per carry in your career, you have to like have a whole book. Like if I was to say, well, yeah, give it to him three times in a row and he won't get a first down. That may have never happened in his career. There may have yeah. never been a point in his career where three consecutive carries from Kennedy Brooks didn't equate to 10 yards. If I ran an Oklahoma website, I would totally look that stat up. <laughs> I, would, I would look it up. Has there ever been a three-play sequence, even if it was over two games, last two carries in one game and the first carry? I just wonder if he's ever had three consecutive carries where – the yardage added up didn't at least break 10 yards. Because on paper, that's 21 yards. So it's probably happened this year because he's got this horrible 6.0 yards per carry. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably happened this year because he sucks at six, six yards per carry. Uh, anyway, I'm running back out. I'm good. I've said, all, I've said my piece on running games. Thanks for checking out the video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button if you have not yet already. And if you like what you saw, give it a thumbs up because that helps other people find the video. But uh, catch. Cheers, buddy. Yeah, man. Do that stuff. Click all those things he said. Later. Lots of clicking. <laughs>